tell you, when you're, when you're getting ready for vacation, it means you work three times as hard when, before you go and two times as hard when you get back. So I get an amen from Reverend Smiley on that one. Uh, because we had to get the services done for the next few weeks before I left. And I read this lesson today, and I was not exactly inspired, because it's sort of part of the story. I almost titled this sermon, Cleopas and the Other Guy. Cleopas and the Other Guy. You know who they were? Elaine just sang us the, the part of the lesson we didn't read today. We've been in John's Gospel for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to go back to John's Gospel, but today we switch over to Luke, which is a little bit different understanding, a little bit different sequence. Because in John's Gospel, if you remember last week, we talked about Thomas not being present when the disciples were gathered together. Jesus showed them his hands and his side, and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it until I'm there. And then he breathed the Holy Spirit into them. This is a little bit different, because in Luke, Luke is the author not just of the Gospel of Luke, he's the, the author of the Acts of the Apostles as well. When we get to Pentecost, we will go to the second chapter of Acts to read that story. So the disciples in this account haven't quite received the Holy Spirit yet. And this is what happens after Cleopas and the other guy, the unnamed follower of Jesus, are on the Emmaus Road and they meet him. Because it says at the beginning, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Same message as John's Gospel. Jesus always comes with a message of peace. But he is coming as the Cleopas and the other guy, the unnamed disciple, are explaining to them what happened on the road. And Elaine just sang that. That's one of the reasons we had her sing a song about the Emmaus experience, which was read in another year in the lectionary, but not this year. If you remember the story, Jesus appears to them, but they don't know who it is. They're walking on the road. Their hearts are broken because they thought he was the one. They thought he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And their hearts are broken because... They're talking about the empty tomb and what it might mean because they're still not sure that he's been raised. They think perhaps his body has been stolen. And they see a stranger who says, what's going on? And they're like, are you the only guy in Jerusalem who has no idea what's been happening? And Jesus then explains to them, using the scriptures, for Jesus the scriptures meaning the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, not the New Testament. It was not, there wasn't a New Testament at this time. And he explains to them how everything of God's promises, every single one of God's promises, had been fulfilled in Jesus. And then he pretends he's going on along, and they say, oh, please come in and stay with us. Hospitality is so crucial in this culture, as well as it should be in our own. And when Jesus breaks the bread, their eyes are opened, and they understand that this is the Lord that they have seen. And then he disappears from their sight, and even though they had been walking this long road, they were dejected, they were exhausted, they turn and they run back to the disciples and they say what they had seen. And Jesus, as he does in John's Gospel, shows up apparently in another locked room or another place where the disciples are gathered. He shows up without being asked, without being invited, without having a key to the place. Jesus is in their midst. And he says, peace be with you. And what do they think? They think he's a ghost. Now, if you remember, this isn't the first time they thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a ghost when he walked to them on the water to calm the storm. Now they think he's a ghost because they can't quite wrap their heads around what the women have said. And the women in Luke's gospel had gone back as the messengers had told them and told them that he is alive and he's going to see you as he promised. But they're scared and they think he's a ghost. And he does what he had done with the disciples in that locked room in John's Gospel. He shows them his hands and his side, and he says to them, touch me. And then my favorite line in this, what do you got to eat? Because Jesus likes a good meal. Remember how during Lent we spent all those times talking about the meals that Jesus ate with sinners, with disciples, with crowds gathered on a hillside? Jesus wants something to eat to show them that a ghost does not eat only someone who has been raised. He shows them the marks of the resurrection, or the marks of his crucifixion, but then he's in a resurrected state. And they knew that he had died and that he had been in the grave for three days. But here he is standing in their midst talking to them. So, Cleopas and the other guy. I rejected that in favor of, if you see something, say something. Which is the, I don't know what you call it, the tagline, the motto, 
the instruction given by what government agency? Do you remember? Homeland Security. If you see something, say something. Have you ever driven down the Beltway and they flash that up on the road? If you see something, say something. What are they talking about? If you see what? If you see someone suspicious, call. Now, when you're a kid, they call this tattling, don't they? Not, not in my case, because with my mother, when I was a kid, I would feel so guilty. I would have made a good Jew, a good Catholic, or a good Methodist preacher, because I always felt so guilty. I always went to my mother and confessed what I had done. And I was so convicted of my sin that I confessed not only for myself, but my sister as well, who unfortunately did not feel the same compunction to confess that I did. But I really was trying to clear up her act as well as my own. But if you see something, say something. If you see something suspicious. Now, we all know that this is not a bad thing unless it's taken out of context, which we unfortunately see now. A friend of mine, a pastor, who is now serving in Michigan, but he's still a member of the Baltimore-Washington Conference. I've known him since he was 15 years old, was feeding ducks with his son in his neighborhood, and someone called the police and said, there's a suspicious man outside. And the police came and harassed him because he was black. He was in his own neighborhood feeding ducks with his son. And the media is full of stories right now about Asian Americans who are being harassed in the streets. If you see something, say something. Not if you see activity that looks really like something wrong, but now we're just looking for trouble everywhere. And I said a few weeks ago in the sermon, those who look for trouble will always find trouble. But what are we called to be witnesses to? Are we called to be witnesses to the things in life that are suspicious? Or are we called to be witnesses to the things of life that give hope and peace and Jesus Christ that we give to the world? That's what we're called to see in the world. But we have become so unaccustomed to seeing Christ in the world. Jesus is with us. This is what this passage is about. Take it out of its context, the short little passage. He's with us in the hospitality when we feed others. He's with us at the table. He's with us in acts of compassion and kindness. He's with us when we pray for one another. He is with us to open our hearts and our minds to the scripture because that is what he does with the disciples. That's what he'll continue to do with the disciples. He did that with Cleopas and the other guy. He did that with these disciples. He'll do that on Pentecost. He will open their minds that they may understand the scriptures. And when we come together in his name, the scriptures are opened for us. How many of you have ever been involved in a Bible study? I'm talking to the people who are here. If you want to raise your hand at home, I can't see you, but I just heard a beep. With other folks, don't you learn more when you're sharing that story with other people and getting their perspectives? Christ will be with you in that situation. Christ will be with us whenever we are together in his name. Christ is with us here and now. Christ is with our neighbors. Some of them are probably hearing Christ's name for the first time in a while. I remember several years ago, I was doing a service, and it was on Ash Wednesday, and one of the elderly members of my congregation had a caretaker who brought her to church that evening, and she had her 8-year-old daughter. And her daughter looked at her during the service and said, Mommy, why is that lady cussing? And she looked at her and said, She's not cussing, and she said, She keeps saying Jesus Christ. Because the only time the child had ever heard Jesus Christ was when someone was using his name in swearing. Now, we've got to get better at looking for Christ in the world. We've got to get better at looking for Christ in the mirror. We've got to get better at looking for Christ in each other because then the presence of Christ will inform our ministry, open our hearts and our minds to the scripture, and we will extend hospitality and grace and peace to everyone we meet. I told you that this afternoon the youth are gathering and they're going to do a photographic scavenger hunt. There are some things like photograph a bug or a spider web or something above you or something below you. But one of the things on the list is photograph something that reminds you of the resurrection. I have a friend that I take pictures with often and my friend has uh, a collection of photographs through the years that he's taken and he posts them on Facebook and they're always of hearts. Sometimes it's a heart someone's drawn on the sidewalk, but more often than not, it's a heart in nature, a heart-shaped leaf or a rock or a stone or something that just sort of shows up in the water that looks like a heart. And he'll post it every day and he'll say on his Facebook page, where did you see love today? And people will answer, I saw love 
when my neighbor came over and brought me dinner. I saw love when my child came up and threw his arms around my knees and hugged me tight. I saw love here. I saw love there. Now, the thing is, when you start seeing hearts, you start seeing them everywhere. So what we need to do is train ourselves to start looking for Christ everywhere. Look for signs of the kingdom and the resurrection because we are witnesses to these things. It is not a ghost that we're here to worship. It's not someone who died and who was buried and whose memory we keep alive by our talking. This is the risen Christ, the Son of the living God who is with us in our midst every time we gather, every time we're alone, especially when we feel helpless and hopeless and afraid. Christ is with us, willing to show us his wounds, willing to say, touch me, willing to eat with us. I love that. You got anything to eat? Now, I hope that soon we'll be able to gather for meals together again. I hope one day soon, sometime soon, soon, I don't know how many years soon is anymore, but when we can share the bread and the cup together. But as long as we're here together and gathered, it doesn't matter that some of us are at home and some of us are here. We are together in Jesus Christ. But we've got to be a witness. Now, have any of you heard of N.T. Wright? He is a bishop in the Anglican Church. He's also a biblical theologian. I was blessed to hear him speak a few years ago, and he's a wonderful man. He's very funny and very knowledgeable and very down to earth. And he wrote a book on the resurrection and what it means for the church today. And he talked about the witnesses to the resurrection being women. And he said, one of the reasons we know the story is true is because no one would have ever believed it. Because sometimes people say, well, it didn't happen the same way in Matthew as it did in Mark and Luke and John, and it didn't happen the same way. But what happened was that Jesus was raised. And he thinks that because they had women reporting it, women could not be credible witnesses in the civil proceedings of the day because they were women and they were considered to be frivolous and not to be taken seriously. And N.T. Wright said if this was all a big hoax, they would have gotten a better story together and everyone would have told the same story, but people told it as they saw it and as they experienced it. So maybe we should be Cleopas. Cleopas, you hear his name one time in scripture, but more than Cleopas, be the other guy. Be the unnamed person, because we're not always going to be Simon Peter. We're not always going to be Andrew. We're not always going to be one that is remembered for a specific task. But we are here today because they took that word into their hearts, because the scriptures were open to them, because they continued to tell the story of him to the next generation, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one before you. Now it's up to you to tell the one after and the one after that and the one after that so that Christ who is raised, who is not a ghost who is the very presence of God can be made known in you and in me and in the ministries of Epworth and every other church on the planet to the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Amen Amen, Amen Would you join now in singing